Welcome to Coaching While Black. I am your host, Chris Reed. I'm joined by my co-host, Anthony Andino. What's up? Armand Richards. And today we're going to be talking about systems change with our illustrious guest, Renata Simril, who is the president and CEO of LA84 Foundation and the Play Equity Fund. Renata, welcome to Coaching While Black. What's up, coaches? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> So we're really blessed and honored to have you here today. Um, And so we're going to start, we're going to jump right into it. We're talking about systems change, and that sounds like a loaded conversation. So first, could you explain to our audience, to our listeners, what you do with uh, LA84 and the Play Equity Fund? You are running two Sport for Good organizations at the same time, which is phenomenal, amazing. So please share with with our audience what you do and how you do. Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me, um, and thanks for what you guys do. Um, certainly um, a coach can change the trajectory of young, young kids' lives and the way in which the Center for Healing and Justice, um, you know, really gets the essence of trauma-informed coaching to bring out the best in the athlete. Thank you for what you do. Thank, Thank you. you. The L84 Foundation is the legacy of the 1984 Olympic Games. We happen to be celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. It's kind of, you know, mind-boggling. Yeah, we are. Thing. I was born in 84, so we're definitely celebrating <laughs> something this year. <laughs> Happy, Happy, birthday. Happy early birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, the Olympics in 84 was the most financially successful games in the history of the Olympic mm. movement. A lot of wow. people don't know that. It made, 200, made $232.5 million wow. um, from the sponsorship model, the te- television um, revenue model, um, and it just was hugely successful. And a portion of that surplus came to start the L84 Foundation. And the mission behind our work has been building a better world through sports um, and really reinvesting those dollars back into the community. And so for 40 years, we've been funding sport-based youth development, youth sports organizations to give kids free and low-cost opportunities to access what we know to be the transformational power sport. We've been doing coaching education, so we've trained you know, something like 180,000 coaches mm. over the years. Wow. Um, we actually started coaching. I mean, back at 40 years ago, you know, there wasn't a Center for Healing and Justice. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a Positive Coaching Alliance. It wasn't an up to us. There was a LA84's Art of Coaching. Yeah. Um, and it was really not the X's and O's, but it was about the youth development. How do you actually meet an athlete, a young athlete, a young individual where they are and bring out their best to develop those life skills, those leadership skills? Um, we've also been doing research and convening around the most prevailing issues uh, in youth sports. And when I took over in 2016, um, our board had this idea of being a bigger foundation. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a very small endowment, which we're grateful for, but our, our resources are like peanut butter on a big piece mm-hmm. of bread, right? It was spreading real thin mm-hmm. and missing some corners. And so they, we should fundraise, we should be a bigger, bigger foundation. And I said, well, you know, we need a case for support. Why does a foundation like us, why do we need resources? Mm-hmm. And so I started looking at the data Um, and I'll get to it later, but I was one of those kids. It was obvious despite the investments that we were making um, in the sport-based youth development ecosystem in Southern California, the gap between kids who could afford access Mm. and who couldn't had only gotten wider. Mm -hmm. And so I said, if we were gonna actually deepen our impact, we need to go upstream and ask the question of why the kids are in the river in the first place. Um, You know, why don't they have access? Mm -hmm. Why don't they have fields of play? And let's try to attack that. Um, But let's not attack that by setting up a new program, because there's a lot of organizations out there doing great work. How can we use our platform of this Olympic legacy that has resources to allow us to stay focused? And how can we build a community and lift up the organizations that are doing great work and sort of fill in the gap? And so that's how Play Equity uh, was born. And we've been busily creating this Play Equity movement to address system change, to address narrative and storytelling because people have forgotten the importance of sport play movement Mm -hmm. to our physical health, our mental well-being. Um, positive connections, positive affiliations, academic success. I mean, it really helps young people, you know, build pathways to lifelong well-being, uh, and then obviously unlocking resources um, so that more kids have access to sport plan movement. So that's uh, yeah, it's a little bit about what we do. That too. <laughs> what do you mean by narrative and storytelling? Why is that important to sort of what you do, your mission? Yeah, I, I think um, when you think about youth sports, people think about the 19 billion dollar industrial sports complex, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Where colleges are now, you know, recruiting kids in middle school. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, NIL is giving people, and I'm not, you know, don't want to tell people not to make money and get right. some coin, right? 100%. But, you know, when you're getting it at such a young age, is that really the value yeah. and the importance of sport? Right. Um, and so the narrative change is to get back to the fundamentals that sports play, and we say sports play and movement, really mm-hmm. ro- widening the aperture. So it could be, um, 
you know, sports in the traditional sense, right? My high school basketball team, um, you know, maybe I want to be in a competitive league. That's important. That's good. But then it might be structured sports. So just recreation, after school sports, um, you know, keep me, you know, out of the negative stuff that might, you know, attract young kids in the communities that we serve. But it could also be movement, right? Um, I tried double dutch for the first time, mm. you know, last summer. Oh, How I remember it? that. I remember. I saw that video. How was it? It's hard. It's tough. It's, yeah, yeah, it's tough. tough. In the end, it's a lot more coordination than you think. Right, but not but only just the end. In. Yeah. And then it's like and you're going in the, in, in the, the, the rise and the heart rate, and you know what it's doing to the. Plus, you got to listen to the chant and the cheer and the clapping. I hope nobody else comes in jumping and spinning all in your space. Yeah, you're just doing that one, two, one, two, one, two. And then people doing spins and, yeah, And nah. if you don't tell me that's a sport. That's, that's real life. Yeah, For that's, real. That's yeah, tough. So we widened the aperture, but what we found talking to people is um, they forgot that sport helps with obesity, mm -hmm. right? In LAUSD, nearly 50% of the kids, 600,000 plus kids, plus or minus kids, are obese or overweight yeah. and at risk for type two diabetes. Yeah. When we wow. think about the mental health crisis that young kids are facing today, suicide ideation and suicide rates, you know, as young as 10 years old, mm -hmm. they're tracking now. I mean, our kids are in crisis and we know from the research and data that sport helps to um, keep us physically healthy. Um, you know, the spike in the heart rate, mm -hmm. um, the endorphins that mm -hmm. are released, um, you know, it helps to keep kids health and well, you know, health and um, focus on their health and wellness. Um, and then that connection, um, and I was that kid. I didn't show up to school because I wanted to go to English class right. or math class, yeah. I but play. I was on the basketball team and mm -hmm. I had to show up for school and I had to keep a 2.0 GPA. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we've forgotten about that. And so the narrative change is important to elevate the importance of sport play and movement and why it ails society. Um, and that our belief, our theory of change is that if people value what's important, then they'll fund it. Yeah. Right. So that's part of our overall strategy. So you let the cat out the bag. You play ball in high school. A little bit. A little bit, a little bit. So tell Until us. Until those girls got really big in like <laughs> so high school. Tall. And I was like, I got boxed out once hard. I was like, that was it. That I, was switched, it. I switched to tennis after that. So, <laughs> so tell us about just Renata growing up through sport and your, your journey, because I think hearing your journey and how impactful your journey is and now where you are could paint a picture for a young woman out there who doesn't know what they want to do yet, but love sports and love the impact it's had on their life and they want to have impact yeah. on others. I'm going to blow your mind right now. Let's do it. Uh-oh. There you go. I was one of those kids. Um, you know, grew up, we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor back then. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody was proximate, was, yeah, right? Yeah. But I was um, one of four kids. Uh, my older sister struggled with mental illness. Um, she was di diagnosed schizophrenic at 16. Um, my brother, who was a great baseball player, had some challenges with my stepdad and, you know, ended up finding his family and gang life and mm. was in and out of the juvenile justice mm. system. And, um, and then there was my younger sister and both my parents were working class. So my stepdad was a butcher, my mom was a grocery clerk. And so it was like, sports was my saving grace. Yeah. It kind of mm. kept me on the, mm -hmm. me on the right, uh, straight and narrow. And, you know, I think if it hadn't been for sports, um, cause I was really awkward, shy, sort of this middle school kid, didn't really have direction. I was a latchkey kid. You know, you had the little key around your neck and <laughs> you kind of let yourself in yeah. and bologna and cheese sandwiches yeah. after school. You know, kinda, I had Chef Boyardee, but I'm getting what right, you're saying. Right, right. <laughs> and my brother made this mean um, cinnamon toast. Oh, you know, yeah. Cinnamon bread, okay. right yeah. in the yeah. oven. Um, That's fun after school. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That's fun after school. But I was yeah. that, you know, just this awkward, shy middle kid, school kid that just found their voice and their tribe through sport and mm. kept me connected to school. Um, I didn't apply to college because um, neither one of my parents went to college. And wow. I didn't, I took this thing called the SAT and I was gonna, I, you know, I was thinking I was gonna lie and said I did okay. I actually did horrible <laughs> to, be, to be quite honest. And it wasn't that I wasn't smart, but I just did, there were no expectations yeah. for me to go to college. Yeah. There was no, expectation. So why to, even put effort forward? Why put effort yeah. forward? You know, I mean, no disrespect. My mom provided as beautiful a life as she could, you know, being a union worker for 35 plus years, right? No qualms about that. But it just didn't satisfy me to, you know, working, you know, as a grocery clerk or as a checker. I just, I felt that I had, there was more that life could yeah. offer, um, but I didn't apply to college. So I went to um, community college trying to be productive. And I got a D in geography. I'm like, hmm, the school thing, maybe I'm not ready for the school thing. <laughs> I 
I mean, everybody thinks I'm all finished and polished, right? And you know, like they see me. And, I hear that. And my story is the furthest from the truth. I mean, it is one truly of sports and perseverance, yeah. right? And yeah. just you fail one day and you just get up and you try another, you know, another opportunity. You work on your weaknesses. And so I just um, kept putting one foot forward and trying to be creative. And um, I remember in high school, a recruiter came to, um, an army recruiter came to our campus. And I was like, I need to get to college. I don't have any money. Uh, and I wanted to travel. And so I asked the recruiter, you know, if I go into the service, um, would I get money for college and could I travel? And he said, yes. And so I joined the army and I served three years um, as a military police officer. It's MP. another story. <laughs> yeah. It's another story. Uh, and I was stationed in Europe. Oh, and cool. so um, after that, I did a, a, a year of um, general education um, and then transferred to college and got my first job out of college. But my, my trajectory to... Um, philanthropy and to youth sports uh, and the work that we do, I do now um, was really a circuitous. I had a, year, I had a career in government. I worked in mm -hmm. the city uh, government after the civil unrest to rebuild communities and doing community organizing. Um, I went into real estate to do affordable housing and mixed income housing in the communities that um, you know, I was familiar with and that needed some revitalization. Um, and then I my, married my high school sweetheart and we had two kids. Oh. And somebody had to get off the treadmill of corporate. And so <laughs> yeah. you know, I raised my hand and I just put out to the universe. It'd be great to, you know, give back phil philanthropically. I love sports and happened that the Dodgers changed ownership and they were looking for somebody to run their foundation and their community relations. And, you know, I worked myself into a job and, nice. and then left um, to try to save our fourth estate, the LA Times. And the guy that uh, I went to go work for didn't last past a year. Mm. And, but the universe brought me the L84 Foundation. So I've been doing that for eight years. I think the through line though to my career is about equity and justice. Yeah. It's how to make the communities that I'm from, the community that my families and friends are from, you know, how do we make them better through policies, through um, development? Um, you know, I think oftentimes we see deficit mm -hmm. in the communities that we serve, mm. right? There's something wrong with them. Yeah, yeah. And my philosophy has always been as myself, I had talent. I just didn't have opportunity. Yeah. So I had to go and get the opportunity and yeah. find the opportunity. And I think the work that I've done and certainly at, um, throughout the, my career, but at the L84 Foundation is, you know, how do we match that talent with opportunity? How do we help young people find that bridge, find that social network? And then how do we attack the systems that in some ways are designed to work exactly the way that they're working? Yeah. It's to disenfranchise a group of people based on this concept of racism that's a completely fabricated concept. Um, and so how do we give uh, opportunity to realize the American promise of equity and justice for all? That's that's what my career has been about. Yeah, okay. you answered all my questions. <laughs> all right. well, for real. Uh, I, w I will say, because you're so entrenched in this work, and especially in Los Angeles, place of disparity across the board. You know, you can be in one neighborhood and it's all mm. good. And then you, you go- spit on a million dollar house. Oh my, right? Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's such a contrast with our young people are growing up in, in this city because systems change needs to happen at every level of sport. But especially we're talking just youth level, like what's the one thing you're passionate about that if, if you do nothing else, this is the one thing you want to change. You know, if you Right off into the sunset. What's the one thing you could just put your put your <laughs> finger on to say I, I had a hand in that? I don't think it's one. We we have a new um, content firm that's that's helping us um, with our 40th anniversary mm -hmm. and sort of do, do our storytelling and narrative. And um, they did this exercise where they ask you to write a headline mm. of where you see you know L84 and the Play Equity Fund. I didn't read 2028. I read like in the future. Mm -hmm. And so you know I had two headlines. One headline was um, the U.S. Department of Education. Um, partners with the Play Equity Fund to ensure a after-school sports program in every public school in America. Ooh, wow. Ooh, yeah. Right? Um, you know, yeah. the other was um, to get on uh, McKinsey Scott radar screen and, you know, mm -hmm. announce a $100 million investment into the Play Equity Fund to continue yeah. our work. She got that hot fire coming out right now. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But if I was to say really the impact that I think I can leave is is building a, being a bridge builder. Mm. Is that... Um, you know, just the, the concept of system change is I don't think people who are, pro we know what that means, mm -hmm. yeah. right? We talk about system change. We talk about oppression. Yeah. We talk about- And we understand um, the context surrounding the statements. And the, 
the root cause of, of those systems, you know, being, being embedded in racism and disenfranchising people of color, poor communities, et cetera. But I was at a dinner party um, maybe a month ago and my husband and I were the only black people in the room. Mm. And it was a uh, Jewish people, some Catholic people. I mean, not to be a faith thing, but yeah. I kind of knew some of the people mm-hmm. and sort of their orientation and, and really good friends of ours. And we're having this conversation about um, the assault on diversity, equity, inclusion mm. with the Harvard president yeah. um, being, you know, the whole thing about the Middle East, which yeah. that's another, that's a, show, that's a whole thing for another show. She should have just said the right thing, but that's not what we're talking about. But um, as we were talking about um, the need for system change um, and the person that my husband was talking to was really having a hard time grasping and I can see he was feeling uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And so my husband was about to go in, brilliant man, intellectual. Um, and I said, hold on a minute. I don't think, let me just give you some context of what we mean by system change and why the work of um, affirmative action or diversity, equity, inclusion is important. And so I talked about, he was in the financial business space and I said, you know, banking is a system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the banking industry has redlined an entire community mm-hmm. that has prevented people of color particularly black people from uh, applying for home ownership loans or business loans. I said, so when you think about the results of that, so for every $1 of wealth, black families have 10 cents, Latino families have 12 cents. Mm -hmm. And so there's a system, the banking system, that have kept a group of people out of that opportunity Mm -hmm. that the results of, now they don't have the equity to send their kids to college, to afford youth sports, to afford a coach, right? And the look on his face when I shared this, and I kind of went into some other things, but the look on his face was like, oh, I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so when I say a bridge builder, is that as we talk about system change, um, we have to bring people along with us, Yeah. right? We have to create a, a shared common understanding of, of why it's important, yep. um, sort of the historical context of how, what we mean by systems and how those systems have disenfranchised a group of people that are causing a lot of societal ills that we have today, Yeah. right? My brother was not in the juvenile justice system because, you know, he was a bad person. Right. He's a good person. Mm-hmm. He just couldn't sort of find, and that when he did a this first petty crime, you know, he gets the maximum of the punishment. Yeah. Yeah as opposed to maybe having a little bit of grace or a little bit of, and saying, hey, you're a good baseball player. You know, your punishment is not going to CYA. Uh Maybe your punishment is, you know, staying committed to school and Mm. staying committed to Mm. your baseball program and making sure that you have the right coach. Yeah. Right, So, uh, so I think for me, if there was one thing that I could live on this, this earth, this, the journey that I'm on, Mm -hmm. is really to be a, a bridge builder and to help not just bring awareness to the inequities that exist, but also a shared understanding of what we mean by system change and why it's so important for us to change it so that we can aspire to that ideal of American justice and equity for all. I love the idea of building those bridges for sure, but like carrying people along, explaining to them and shining that light when you're able to share an analogy or turn that light bulb on to a to a high, high level, high minded concept like system change for another person, I do think that that is way more powerful and part of the reason why I asked about narrative and storytelling. Mm -hmm. Because I find that in Black History Month especially, a lot of my non-black friends will regurgitate the stuff they see on TV and stuff, but it's like, oh, that's not, yeah. that's not my it. story. Yeah, that's yeah. not our thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, not sure. really you understanding. It's like, the same you, seven people you've been talking about for 20 years. It would have better if you Malcolm X, the movie. Like, we can have a real conversation right. then, but like, you being able to share my story mm-hmm. lets us have a far deeper conversation yeah. than you having your story and my story being over here and like, us trying to have a conversation about yeah. what's the best yeah. way these stories should end. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I think it's uncomfortable um, for um, people who don't aren't proximate or don't live our experience. Right. It's really uncomfortable to understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. We've grown up with it. We we talk about it on Sunday. I remember, I remember Mark Cuban, you know, made a comment years ago. He says when white families are talking about racism at the dinner table, then you know you have some progress towards system change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think the for me it's been about how do you how do you extend an invitation mm-hmm. without with grace mm-hmm. and without guilt to bring people along and to say that it's not a zero sum game. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when we talk about system changes, I'll just give you an example. We were um, 
Um, you know, one of the successes last year that we're most proud of is uh, we helped Senator Josh Newman from Orange County pass a recess bill mm-hmm. um, that mandated recess in all public schools in the state of California for 30 minutes, and it can't be used as punishment. Oh. So there were some educators oh God, actually taking, 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 taking recess, recess away, away. from yeah. kids that might have behavioral problems mm-hmm. because of ADHD right. or trauma at home or whatever the thing is. Well, you can't go to recess when it's precisely where they need to go. When they need the movement. Yeah, they need that yeah. more than anything. Yeah. We all know how important that is for regulating our brain, how movement is like so healing and so impactful. Yeah. And you take that Your away kids from are a person. Never better who, than after recess. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. I am. So I was sharing the update at a board meeting and you know, we kind of a number of things that we had done that year and we got to the recess bill and I was shocked in a, in a I don't say shocks the wrong way. I was unexpectedly caught off guard of the level of conversation my board members wanted to have mm. about the recess bill. And when we started talking about, well, what do you mean there's no recess? There was sort of this nostalgic feeling mm-hmm. of them being young and having recess. Mm. And you said, what do you mean to tell me public schools? And most of the, their kids went to private school. Yeah. You mean to tell me public schools don't have recess? And so we started to, and it was, it was this, wow, that's great. We need to promote that more, which was very heartwarming mm-hmm. to me because there is an explanation of inequities, mm-hmm. a need for system change that we were able to meet do- toward a common shared purpose that was able to exemplify why play equity and the play equity movement that we've created as part of the foundation was so important. And so that to me is bridge building, right? There yeah. is the inside outside game that's needed. You yeah. still have to push. But I think when you push so hard that it causes our allies to feel a certain way, guilty, um, defensive. defensive, defensive. I don't know how to help. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that gets us anywhere. And so in the context of, you know, Olympism or the power of sport to bring communities together, that's what we're trying to create with the play equity movement, to create a, a movement where everybody feels a sense of belonging. Mm. And it's really about um, the sum of us, to use an, uh, a Heather like McGee, that. right? <laughs> As opposed to a zero sum game. Um, there's so much coming to the city of LA in the near future. You got mm-hmm. um, World Cup 26. We have Super Bowl coming up in a year, All-Star Game coming up, 20 to 28 Olympics. How do you see LA 84 and the Play Equity Fund interacting and you know, kind of drive the right type of narratives in those moments? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was completely um, surprised as to why every Olympic edition didn't have a Play Equity, I mean, mm. a, an LA 84 foundation. Yeah. Um, now look, I, I get that not every Olympic Games is profitable, but the intent of saying we want to make an investment mm-hmm. in youth sports, um, so it's just it's it's sort of bewildering to me why there's there's some other legacies, but just us. Um, but my uh, good friend Kathy Sloshman, um, who's been a, behind a lot of these major sporting events, she runs the Los Angeles Sports Entertainment Commission. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, has partnered with us, um, starting with the Super Bowl that was here last time. Um, because she saw the same thing. She says, you're great at community impact. The leagues um, want to make an impact in community. So why don't you curate what that legacy should look like? Mm. And you run, you manage that for us in partnership. And so we did that for the Super Bowl in 2022. We did that for the college football playoffs. Um, and now we're starting to prepare for the World Cup and developing what that legacy looks like. And so we've had a, a front row seat mm-hmm. in terms of making sure that those major sporting events have impact mm. um, in the communities that quite frankly, can't afford to go to the game, you know, if I'm yeah. being real. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what we're doing again, play equity is about how do we lift up um, organizations and individuals doing good in the community. Uh, and so for the Super Bowl legacy, we recognize 56 organizations on the ground every day doing the work and did videos, gave them a grant. And then we use the platform of the NFL uh, Channel 11 with Christine Devine picked them up and did a series um, and the multiplier effect of awareness building mm-hmm. for the work that these organizations are doing, um, the multiplier effect in terms of more support and more resources um, was just a beautiful thing. You know, one of the smaller grants were about $10,000 and there was one organization, you know, that came up and it was grateful. And, you know, I felt I need to apologize. I was like, you know, I wish we could do Good more money. money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she said to me, um, you know, Renata, you know, the money is great, she says, but the, the fact that you see us, mm-hmm. the fact that oh, there wow. was an acknowledgement for the work that we're doing in the community, she says, thank you yes. for lifting us up. And so I think more of that to come, um, you know, with certainly the Super Bowl in 2027, but the World Cup as well. I think that's one of your superpowers that people 
for whatever reason don't equate is like you show up <laughs> and not only just show up like you're out in front you know like if the kids are playing she's playing <laughs> you know she talked about double dutch but you show up yeah. and a lot of leaders play the background so much and 100%. i think that's what makes what you do real authentic and it creates that bridge because you're out there with people and that's true leadership yeah. so i commend you and thank you for all that you do yeah, to, to your listeners, if I could say on sure. this, look, again, I was one of those kids, right? And for for us to advance equity and justice for all kids, the coaches out there, the organizations, the leaders, we have to show up and be sustaining, mm-hmm. right? Because too often in the communities that we serve, people pop dip in and they dip out. Yes, right? all the right? time. And, oh, that, yeah. all the and time. that you lose trust mm-hmm. with your community. Mm-hmm. And what I'm most proud of is that I'm one of those kids and so I want to make sure that I'm showing up, mm-hmm. that I'm letting them know I'm not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. L84 is sustained for 40 years. Yeah. Play Equity Fund is going to sustain for 40 years. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, um, that's, I think, how you drive change, by being intentional, by being authentic, by trusting, and by showing up. Awesome. Now, before we get out of here, do you have any calls to action, anything that people can follow, any way that people can support the work you do? This is your time to let <laughs> folks know what's up. Well, yes, um, I'm, I'm on this mission um, because I'm showing up in the community, so I yes. don't always show up on my social <laughs> handles. So follow me <laughs> at, at Renata Angelino. Um, that's my uh, my Twitter and Instagram handle. Um, but join the Play Equity movement. So, you know, wherever you are, um, whatever you can do, um, just get involved and, and help our kids and communities across this country thrive. Awesome. Renata, thank you so, thank so you much so for joining much. us today. <laughs> you you dropped guys. a ton of knowledge on us. <laughs> I hope that people really take in what you said, become bridge builders, but also join your movement. Um, join our movement. Our, our movement. movement. And we're we're waiting, waiting for that right. book. Like I our said, we're movement. waiting for that book. And we're waiting on your podcast. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, whenever yeah. you get that started, we'll, we'll be all good. Yes. <laughs> no, we got you. I got you. Um, but thank you so much for thank joining you. us. We really appreciate your time. And with that, uh, that's Coaching Wild Black. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Peace. That was awesome. Nice. The Mob House. Hey.